What people don't realize at Utah is it's arguably the, the most unique melting pot in all of college football as far as the different cultures that you you have the LDS, non-LDS, you have married players, non-married players, you have African-American, white players, Hispanic players, and then you have this Polynesian culture that not many people were of. Unlike today, with many college football teams having several Polynesian players and a Polynesian coach on staff, in 2004, Utah was an anomaly. Over the years, Ron McBride had established a pipeline of Polynesian players. His recruiting success came from the close personal ties he had developed within the Polynesian communities in Hawaii, the West Coast, and Utah. The number of Polynesian players on the roster, along with their attitude and approach to the game of football, was something that Meyer had not previously encountered. You know, I was very resistant to Urban's ways. Uh, you know, I know some of the other Polynesian kids were resistant to his ways. He was equally frustrated with, <laughs> with how we acted. Um, yeah, and he wasn't used to, he wasn't used to the kind of guys that, you know, dragged their feet to get to the field, you know, or laughing and singing right before you got to get into a competitive drill. And then all of a sudden they flip a switch, you know, and they're kicking everybody's ass. Um, he wanted that guy, again, he wants everything to be, you know, very regimented. You know, I want you to act like this. I want you to say this. I want you to do this. Um, and Polynesians don't often fall into that, um, that category. So there was, there was some adjustment with both of us. Two activities would serve as catalysts to develop cohesiveness amongst the team. One was instituted by Meyer, the other by the players. And when we first took the job, it was a very segregated uh, team. It was uh, a lot of clicks on the team. When I had this dinner at my house, I'll never forget, we both, once again, Shelly and I are looking at the team and we're having this dinner out in my backyard. And you had the black kids sit over there, white kids sit over here, Polynesian kids, married kids, Mormon kids. Everybody was separated. Not much conversation going on. Meyer took an unconventional approach in an effort to enhance team unity. Actually started the bleeding. It was bleeding meetings. Uh, and it's just a theory that I've had for a long time and I saw it work. And actually Lou Holtz is, we had long talks before I became a head coach. And he told me a story when he went to first went to South Carolina. And every kid has a story, and they want to tell that story. They just don't ever get the opportunity. Personal stories of what they've had to overcome, adversity they face to get where they are. Well, we certainly had a lot of meetings during camp. I mean, Coach, one of his philosophies was always letting guys get up. In fact, every guy had to get up, and uh, coaches included, and kind of just among the team, talk about what the team meant to them, what football meant to them, uh, their teammates. And the best time to do that is in training camp. I usually wait until the third or fourth day when they're just blown out. And there's all the tough guy, all the defense mechanisms are disappear. Uh, you hear some incredible things. And it was a special time for guys to kind of get up and, uh, yeah, kind of open up and pour their hearts out and, and uh, to their teammates and let them know, what, you know, what the game of football means to them, what, what, what Utah meant to them. Um, and a lot of deep stuff came out. You know, I heard about some heartbreaking stuff with, with some of the guys. And um, it just makes you look at each other different. It just makes you want to go a little bit harder for that guy, whatever you know you need to do to be successful for them, for yourself. Um, it just gave you a little bit more motivation. Reza Williams, who was, uh, he was on kickoff team, a good player, not a great player, but a great person, great leader. To this day, I still credit him with turning around a lot of individuals on that team to become team players. Uh, gave up and, and bled all over the team. And I released him and I was walking down and Steve Fafita, who was one of the hardest guys to coach our first year, became one of our greatest guys and great leaders, reached his hand up as I was walking by and grabbed my hand and said, Coach, thank you. We needed this. And I looked at him, he had tears rolling down his eyes. Unbeknownst to the coaching staff, the players had initiated their own off-field routine. In a June afternoon, I'm walking out of the office and I'm getting ready to go home to see, I think my kids get ready to play baseball, my daughter. And I look over and I see Scally walking out to his car and I'm walking my car and he comes over, we start talking. He goes, I gotta run. I said, where are you headed? She goes, well, we're having a, every week we're having cookouts in the park. The Polynesian kids would all get together on the weekend um, and have a barbecue. But that spring, it became something where the whole team would come over uh, 
you know, you, there'd be enough food for everybody. And the whole team would come over, just grab something to eat. And, and you'd just kind of hang out all day. I thought, okay, here's, you know, some of Scali type people. It wasn't. It was Steve Fafita organized the Polynesian group. You know, we had Paris Warren and some of the kids at the other groups. And all these groups kept come together and became the University of Utah. Uh, Utes, go and have a cookout together, hanging out. All for good, all for fellowship and, and to become extremely close. Those are the moments where all the bonding was happening. I think those are the kind of things that, that brought that team together. And I got in the car, tears in my eyes, called my wife and said, if we don't screw this up, we'll win every game we play. The bleeding meetings instituted by Meyer and the players' barbecues produced the bond that the head coach had hoped for, perhaps exceeding his expectation of team chemistry and camaraderie. Teammates, you know, being a part of that team um, and the unity, you know, being in the locker room and talking with those guys and it just was something special. You know, it's a life-changing type of experience. It was such a special group and a special time that, that you had such, you had a group of guys that, that put the team before themselves, uh, coaches included, and that everybody uh, had one goal in mind, and, and that was it, that we were going to go undefeated, that we were going to prove to the whole country that we could play with anybody. That nothing was going to be able to break us, nothing. Even if we, for whatever reason, we were down in a game or anything like that, or something happened off the field, um, it wasn't going to break us. Uh, every year I talk about the 04 Utah team to whether it be the Florida Gators, whether it be Ohio State Buckeyes, whether I'm speaking in some corporate function, I always talk about because uh, that team was colorblind, it was culture blind. And to see that group come together and, uh, I mean, become extremely close, uh, it was just one of the great memories I'll ever have in my coaching career. The necessity needed to realize the vision that Meyer had for the team was the leadership of the upperclassmen. Embracing Meyer's vision, leaders from each position group held their teammates accountable for their effort and attitude. Morgan Scali and Siona Puha, both guys on the defensive side of the ball. I'm an offensive guy. I'm not supposed to like the guys I'm going against on defense on a daily basis, but stuff that those guys did, um, led by example, and stuff that they said has stuck with me, you know, still to this day. Those two were the two best players on our defense, and then they were the two best people off the field. Um, so that's why it was easy to kind of buy into their leadership is because they were great guys off the field, did everything right. Um, and then on the field, they were the, they were the two best guys. I think of guys like Alex Smith and Morgan Scally who are cerebral, who are just smart, smart guys. And they don't care what you think about them. You know, they don't care if they're not the cool guy, right? They'll tell you what they think. After the success of the 2003 season, the confidence of the team was on the rise. The players entered the offseason with an increased focus and determination to achieve even greater success. Well, we started actually in the offseason. You know, we had uh, our offseason program was called Run for the BCS. So we prepared the entire offseason, spring ball, summer camp, and pushed harder than I had you know, the entire team, harder than we'd ever gone before. I mean, we just had a different focus that offseason. I've played many years of football, and that offseason was hands down the best. And there was so much power that came from what we did in the offseason, so much confidence and, uh, you know, just we knew what we could do, and we wanted to make the other teams pay for not working as hard as we did. I think coming off the 10 and 2 season, like we knew that we had a, a great team returning, but in terms of, of goals at the beginning of the season, it was the same as the year before, which is, you know, win the conference, beat BYU, and then if, you know, at that point, you know, it's win your bowl game. You know, we all had the same passion, the same drive, and the same, the same, uh, the same goal in the sense that we wanted to win a championship. Um, and at that time, obviously, the BCS was the ultimate championship goal for us. It was a most, almost like a professional type attitude that we brought uh, to the table, but we also kept the fun in it and kept the, the kids in us. I mean, once you lose the fun aspect of playing football, it's hard to play well. I can recall in August before the season started, we were doing a remote for my radio show out at Stonebridge Golf Course and Urban came on a show and he said 
that this team can be really good. We're going to have to work at it, but we can be really good. And the way and the manner he said it got you so fired up. I can remember he said, we'll play anybody, anytime, even out in the parking lot. But you knew they'd be really good. They had so many key guys back from a two-loss team, a zero and one loss. I can't remember who it was. I've been racking my brain trying to think who it is, and maybe you can dig it up. But a youth player came out and talked about them wanting to go undefeated. I actually caught a lot of flack for this, but um, I, I said when I was interviewed by one of the local newspapers prior to that season, I said, we're, we're going undefeated. That was our goal, and that was what we had talked about. Well, Jesse Boone's one of the hardest guys, greatest kids I've ever been around. And uh, I remember we had a little chat afterwards, and I had a you know, big meeting with our team saying, don't, we don't need that, just focus on the next day. Well, we knew we had uh, a lot of good players coming back, uh, both sides of the ball. We thought we had a chance to be good. How good? You know, you never know for sure. Uh, had our quarterback coming back, most importantly, Alex Smith, which, uh, you know, it's a quarterback-driven game, and, and he had had a, a very good 2003. Like many of his Utah teammates, Alex Smith was overlooked by college recruiters. It may not have helped that Smith played in the same backfield at Helix High School with one of the top recruits in the country, Reggie Bush who opted to play for perennial powerhouse USC. Coming out of high school, Smith had just two scholarship offers, one from his uncle at Louisville and the other from the University of Utah. Smith chose the Utes. As a freshman in 2002, Smith appeared in just one game, playing only a handful of downs against San Diego State. He threw a pick six, got sacked, and threw two completions for a total of four yards, costing him a year of eligibility. He considered a transfer, but elected to stay at Utah. At the beginning of the 2003 season, he found himself as the backup quarterback to Brett Elliott. With six seconds remaining in the second game of the season against Texas A&M, Elliott broke his wrist, giving the sophomore Smith the opportunity to become the starter. The Utes' next game was against Aaron Rodgers and the Pac-10 Cal Bears. With Smith at the helm, the Utes won 31-24. After that win against a BCS conference opponent, Smith never looked back. As a Utes starting quarterback, he lost only one game in his time at Utah. Like his fellow captain, Morgan Scally, Smith was an excellent student, graduating with a degree in economics in just two and a half years. He absorbed Meyer's playbook with the same ease as he did a textbook, executing the spread offense with few mental errors. With the start of the 2004 season just around the corner, a pivotal moment in training camp epitomized the team's character. 